Merry Christmas, everybody. Hope you are doing well. This channel just recently surpassed 100,000 subscribers here on YouTube, which is currently the highlight of my entire life so far. So I just wanted to uh, take this opportunity to address a couple frequently asked questions, do a little Q&A, and also say thank you very much for subscribing. It really means quite a lot to me. And also thank you for commenting. Believe it or not, I really like reading YouTube comments. I try to read every single comment that gets posted. And uh, there's always interesting information in there. I don't know if you've heard the, uh, the saying that like, the fastest way to get an answer on the internet isn't to ask a question, it's to give a wrong answer on the internet. And uh, I don't know how many times that I've exhaustively researched a topic and I have not been able to find you know, some tidbit of information, like historical or you know, uh, technical about some, some product or you know, uh, some gun or something. And then as soon as I post the video, I'll get a comment from like that one guy who just happened to be there and happens to know everything about it. So first question, the one that I get asked all the time, even before I asked for specific, you know, questions for this video is, what is your channel name? How is it pronounced and what does it mean? The channel name is Hoplophile, which is pronounced Hoplophile, like the word Hoplophile, uh, spelled as you probably will see on your screen right now, because I'll try to do an overlay. Uh, it basically means somebody who likes weaponry, derived from the Greek word hoplon. Uh, if you've played Age of Empires 1, you might remember the hoplites, the Greek spear infantry. Uh, so I just I, I picked that uh, name, but I spelled it weird because otherwise it's a very boring name to have on the internet. Um, and the spelling is like a mixture of three or four different inside jokes. Uh, because that's what seemed like a good idea at the time when I was, you know, picking a, I don't know, it was a Steam username or something like that to replace my old one. So, yeah, uh, and I just stuck with it, and unfortunately, I probably missed the window on changing it, because, you know, not like the term hoplophile spelled incorrectly is uh, very searchable or very memorable. I can't be like, you know, hey, look me up on YouTube. Uh, my channel's called Hoplophile. That doesn't work. You can't, you can't do it. Nobody can spell that because it's not a, it's not a real word. Uh, and if you spell the real world word, I think you find something else entirely. So, oops, too late. Now we just have to deal with it. Um, I think I could probably down the line maybe change my channel name to just Hop. I think YouTube would allow that, uh, and it would probably not cause too much of an issue. But then it would be extra confusing because nobody would know why I was called Hop. Anyway, that's it. Yeah, I picked a, I picked the word hoplophile for my screen name on you know Discord and Steam years ago, and I spelled it wrong because it was more interesting that way. Um, I guess I can share some of the inside jokes of that spelling with you. One of them is uh, the the German word for arrow, which is file, and the other one is the way that. Uh, <laughs> The aliens from the Bungie computer game Marathon are spelled the four, P-F-H-O-R, which I really like Marathon, and I like <laughs> the way that the game relentlessly uses the spelling P-F-H instead of just using P-H or F, you know, as, as it would otherwise be more appropriate. So, all right, I planned to do all those comment reads out in the woods, but it was getting cold and dark, and I also couldn't get Instagram to refresh on my phone. So, we're back at home with a laptop, cup of coffee, and a bad cold. All right, we're gonna start with Instagram, or at least as much of Instagram as I can get to load. I can never get the stupid app to refresh on my phone, and then the desktop version is super limited. It says there are 230 comments. I can only get like 50 to show up on my phone and like less than 10 to show up on the desktop version. So, very excellent app. Anyway, Woke Johnny Bravo asks, would you 1v1 me on Rust? No, the game that I'm best at right now is Age of Empires 2, uh, Definitive Edition, so I will 1v1 you on Arabia, uh, but not Rust. I don't actually know what Rust is. Is that the, that's like the survival game that turned into some kind of weird tactical shooter? I'm out of touch. No, it's the children who are wrong. Uh, you should all go follow Woke Johnny Bravo on Instagram, top tier account. Mark asks, is Mabs your favorite? Yes. And now we get very serious. Gunbird asks, how are you going to deal with 114? It still remains to be seen what's actually going to happen with, uh, with HB 114, the measure, the gun control measure that just passed in Oregon. It's being fought tooth and nail by, by everybody. Um, Oregon Firearms Federa Federation, uh, GOA, uh, Firearms Policy Coalition, bunch of injunctions so far are seeming to have some pretty good success. There's basically two components to recent Oregon gun control. 
One is a permit to purchase system and the other one is uh, magazine capacity limits. So it's kind of a half-assed assault weapons ban. They didn't you know, try to ban features like California or Washington. They just went for magazines above 10 rounds and they tried to institute a purchasing permit. Uh, anybody who's not from Oregon doesn't give a shit about this and anybody who is from Oregon is probably well aware of, of what the law is supposed to be. So um, I don't think anybody asked this, but if you're wondering why I don't talk about politics, it's because politics are so localized that it's, it's almost a waste of time. But you know, if you know me in real life, I'll talk to you about politics. Noah Inian asks, thoughts on the results of the Industrial Revolution? The results? I don't know. I don't know much about the results of the Industrial Revolution. We can talk about the consequences, um, but I think we have to go back even farther. I'm going to say that it was the Agricultural Revolution that really set us on the wrong path. Might Be Gage asks, why do you delete old videos? Kind of two different reasons. One is that if I get comments on old videos and I click to respond to the comment, then it opens the video and I have to listen to it. And then listening to myself say things that are out of date or that I don't believe anymore is uh, really irritating. The other reason is uh, because older videos generally were pretty bad and I really don't want somebody to click on my channel and be like, oh, who's this guy? Maybe I'll check this guy out and then randomly select an old video and be like, oh, this guy's an idiot and nothing, you know, none of this is interesting to me. So I want to curate the content to the point where it's, it's representative of what I'm actually doing and hopefully uh, representative of as I say, the quality level that I that I produce, which is I understand is very low. It's not quality content, but it's better than it used to be. Light Auto Rifle asks, dream gun that's functionally inferior to contemporary designs, but you want regardless, or does peak performance petrify potential participants? Ooh, nice one. Uh, I'm, I probably have a whole bunch of different answers for this. I'm gonna throw one out, which is the, uh, the original DPMS Kitty Cat, which was a fixed carry handle style, front sight base 7.5 AR um, and it was sold to I think to be used by SWAT teams as like you know almost such a short small gun that maybe you could probably use it around a ballistic shield or something or like just extremely close quarters so uh, you know the the terminal <laughs> the lack of terminal effect out of a seven and a half inch barrel not so important when you're shooting somebody from the other side of a door jam yes it, you could make a modernized dpms kitty cat and it would still fulfill that same nonsensical role of like you know clearing a a, a tiny room or single hand wielding it on the other side of a ballistic shield uh you wouldn't do that but you could do that and you could do it better than the actual dpms kitty cat but that's the cool version and that's the one that i want Actually, before we move on, uh, DPMS is now owned by Palmetto State Armory, and they keep teasing a version of the Kitty Cat. They keep teasing two versions of the Kitty Cat, one with the fixed carry handle, one without. The one without uh, is the one that has the short barrel and the front sight base, I think, and the proper like aluminum tube free float handguard. The one with the carry handle is, uh, it's got like a clamshell handguard or something, which is incorrect. And DPMS uh, should be able to get carry, uh, carry handle uppers because Nodak Spud, the company that makes all the carry handle uppers in the industry, is also owned by Palmetto State Armory. So if you're wondering where all the carry handle uppers went, it almost looks like Palmetto State bought Nodak Spud and then just killed carry handle uppers. Or they're building up for something, I'm not totally sure. But that's probably one of the reasons you can't really get the Brownells repro rifles right now is I think because they got all their receiver sets from Nodak Spud, and Nodak Spud is now owned by PSA. Again, I, I made all that up. It might not be true, but that's that's my guess. Liquor, Guns, and Rhetoric asks, thoughts on competition, USBSA, IPSC, PRS, gamer stuff, all the way down to something more realistic like tactical games or brutality matches. Um, competition shooting is really cool, um, and some forms of competition shooting can teach you a lot about uh, setting up like gear and and firearms. Not always, and there is a, a like a really strong component of kind of gamesmanship. Um, so like for example, a lot of uh, like stage style like competition shooting is very much about stage memorization and planning. So it's like you you know you walk through the stage before you go. You memorize where the targets are, how they present themselves, how many shots you take from each position, and when you move and when you reload, and all that stuff. Um, 
and that's what it takes to be competitive. So of course people do that, but that also means there's a, a so much more artificiality than you're probably ever going to see. So like unplanned reloads are really hard to practice. Uh, but it's also really difficult to practice like unplanned getting into positions to shoot from. I don't know. I could probably ramble on that for a very long time. Same thing with uh, like barricade shooting. Um, barricade shooting is a good exercise. I refer to it like as an exercise because uh, it's really difficult to find any like combat footage of people shooting weird rollover prone stuff, you know, or anything like that. And the, of course the, uh, the VTAC barricade is not a shape that exists in nature. Um, so it's just a little strange, I guess. But yeah, uh, you're moving and shooting and that's extremely good for you. Um, also, it's just exciting and that gets people involved. OJGSXR6 asks, why are the biggest gun channels based out of the Pacific Northwest when they have the shittiest gun laws and politics? Uh, up until just a few weeks ago at this point, Oregon had pretty fantastic gun laws, uh, and some people are fighting very hard right now to make sure they stay that way. But politics-wise, uh, yeah, I don't know, man. Like, it just, just don't read the billboards and you won't have your day ruined. But the reason I think that big is, or bigger gun channels tend to be in the Pacific Northwest is because there's public land here, so the kind of shooting that you can do, or just I, on the west half of the state entirely. So um, not just the Pacific Northwest, but like Utah particularly, um, Arizona, all those places where you can go out and shoot on big expanses of public land. The types of shooting you can do are so different than anything you can do, you know, generally on like the Eastern Seaboard or in a lot of more built up areas where, you know, there's only so much, it's difficult to even film at a 25 yard indoor range. Imagine now, okay, you're not allowed to draw from a holster. That limits what you can do. You can't move, obviously, because you've got one little tiny lane. You don't, you know, you can't even like take a step to the side when you reload. If you are restricted to indoor ranges or, you know, outdoor covered ranges with a lot of uh, range rules, everything becomes like notional. You know, you, you do slow fire handgun shooting and then you're like, okay, now I imagine this is what I would do if I had to move and shoot and reload or whatever. But you can't put any, uh, cannot put any of it into practice, so you can't demonstrate anything. You can't really learn any uh, interesting lessons from that shooting. So yeah, uh, you got to be able to go out into the woods, basically. Sano Legio says, the year is 2040. It's been four years since the bombs dropped. Optimistic. You pick up your blank and make sure your blank is secure on your hip. You proceed to trek into the wasteland to scavenge supplies. Hmm. I assume if something is on my hip, it must be a firearm because uh, I don't believe in, in water on my waistline, so it's not a trusty canteen. So I guess I pick up my uh, Militia Works Joe Carbine with an ACOG and a Arisaka white light on it and make sure my Glock is secure to my hip. I don't... I don't know. This would be a way cooler what-if scenario if I was a more interesting person. Grant M. asks, Do you like any surplus or weird guns for a little bit of collecting at all, or are you totally devoted to only practicality when it comes to your firearms? You've probably seen, if you have watched my channel, you've seen that I have a lot of videos about old, discontinued, uh, outdated stuff, like 90s polymer, loves uh, old Spanish pistols, all that sort of thing. So I totally like collecting. I used to also have more interest in like milserp rifles so i still have some old milserp you know bolt actions and stuff i like the historical aspect and the design aspect of old firearms quite a lot uh, but i don't like it when those two things intersect when people try to uh, take old impractical stuff and then just lie to the world and themselves about how it can be totally competitive in a modern sense so yeah don't don't mix the two that's why i think yeah you know I'll have a video about uh, a discontinued Spanish pistol from, you know, the late 80s, or early 90s, and then the next day we'll talk about night vision. But I'm not shooting the Spanish pistols under nods, you know what I mean? Speaking of modernizing old stuff, Occam's Razor 2131 says, The 100K special should be a series on modernizing an AK in the same vein as your old PTR videos. The reason I think those are fun is because there are theoretically appealing aspects of guns like like the G3 platform or like AKs where you're like, well, that's that's a feature I like so much that I can't get in some other part of the modern market. You know what I mean? So 
the roller delay blowback system uh, of the G3 is is very robust, and uh, you know I guess it's uh, relatively resilient to like temperature. So you think, wow, it would be really cool if I could get that gun, you know, and like I'm set it up for you know modern use because I want that feature, that rugged reliability. Uh, but it's just not modern. The AK, I guess, is a very similar idea, right? You you want that ruggedness and uh, that ability to function in adverse conditions, I guess, and so you want to try to modernize it to make up for its other shortcomings. So it's interesting to try to modernize those things. I ultimately don't think it's super worth it because I bet you can find something better uh, if you just stop lying to yourself and admit that most of the reason you like those is because they're retro and cool, which is, that's the reason why you like those. Matt Myers, B.E. Myers. Not the real one, for sure. Uh, asks, what's something you've wanted to review but could never find? I would really like to get my hands on an AMT on duty. Um, I have an AMT backup. It's a piece of crap Saturday night special. Uh, and AMT is one of those companies that was like in the ring of fire, you know, California companies that just made cheap cast guns by the truckload. It never worked. And they would constantly get sued and go out of business and reform under a new name for like 30, 40 years. AMT was like upscale Saturday Night Specials. They made 1911s, the hardballer, uh, that looked really cool. They like look really slick and shiny, but they never really worked. And AMT made a pistol called the On Duty in, I think, the early 90s, um, which was supposed to be like a legitimate modern uh, police duty handgun, as the name suggests. So it was, you know, it's like a polymer frame, single action, double action, 9mm, 40 Smith & Wesson, you know, like a cop gun, basically. And uh, they were made in such low numbers, I don't think I've ever seen a picture of a real one. I've only seen pictures of advertisements for them. So, um, I mean, yeah, those things must be vanishingly rare. I don't think I've ever even found like a post on the internet of somebody claiming to have owned one. So that would be cool to find because uh, it's got that, that stuff I love. 90s polymer, old cop guns, discontinued Saturday Night Special garbage. That guy 371 asks, which autistic gun guy argument are you the most tired of? Uh, the thing that I get really annoyed at is seeing people talk about carry handle mounted optics as if they're the same as like a Unity or a Scalarworks uh, tall, you know, riser. Um, like a 1.93 or like 2.2 that Unity uses. And people will always like, you know, they put the two next to each other like infographic style, like look, it's the same height. And you're like, yes, it's it's the same height, but the carry handle and the mount for it take up a huge amount of space on the top of the receiver, which is where your nod goes. That doesn't happen on a Scalarworks, you know, or a Unity because you mount it all the way forward on the receiver and then it's really tall. And there's a bunch of negative space behind it, which is where your night vision goes. So people saying like, oh fuck, carry handle meta, it's perfect for night vision. Why didn't we just stick with that? Why aren't we going back? It's sort of like the flat earth thing. 99% of those people are just shit posting but there are some people who actually believe that a carry handle mounted red dot is perfect for passive aiming with night vision. Um, and those people haven't tried it yet. Scuba410 asks, what do you do for work besides this and TFB TV? And if you say OnlyFans, well, I'm out, dog. Uh, I'm currently unemployed because YouTube isn't a real job. Mega Schiller asks, how good are you at Doom? I'm not sure which Doom he's referring to. Um, but did capitalize all the letters in Doom, which makes me think it's probably New Doom, uh, in, in which case the answer is not very good. But I did uh, play through the entire um, John Romero mission pack for Doom, the one that he released, what was it called, Sigil. That was awesome. I beat that on the hardest difficulty after like working my way up from like medium hard up to all the way at the top. That was a really excellent little pack of levels. So I was pretty good at that Doom. Whale Bear Moose asks, will you ever do more video game content? Probably, if I ever have time. Mike Gordon 98 asks, what made you switch from doing mostly handgun content to rifle slash AR stuff now? Um, mostly it's just because I started off pretty much exclusively shooting handguns and the only like AR stuff that I did was just kind of like joke builds or you know, just goofy stuff. Uh, like seven and a half inch AR pistols, you know. Because um, I, I was of the perspective that like, yeah, handguns are the most likely thing that you'll ever have to use in your life to defend yourself or others. So I spent a lot of time getting good at shooting handguns and I also really like, you know, old handguns and stuff. So that was a lot of what I collected at the time. Um, and 
probably didn't really start down the rabbit hole until I decided to build my first practical AR. And then at that point I was like, okay, now I got to support this with, you know, uh, load bearing equipment. And yeah, once you start down that rabbit hole, it's a long way down. Rooftop operator asks, did Jeffrey Epstein kill himself? I'll ask, what makes you think Jeffrey Epstein is dead? Ginger Cattleman asks, who is a better shot, brass facts or yourself? And why do loophole LPVOs and red dots disappoint? Um, I think I'm probably a slightly better handgun shooter than Brass Fax, but I think he's probably faster on the draw than I am, and I think he's probably a better rifle shooter than I am. So, yeah, I'd say he's probably going to get the win like 8 out of 10 times. Uh, as for why do loophole LPVOs and Red Dots disappoint, I have this theory that like loophole are just legendary tier choke artists. Like, they get 99% of the way to a perfect optic, and then they just completely biff it at the last second. And it's like a curse or something. Like, I don't I don't think they know they're doing it. I don't think they can help themselves. I think they're like a... Far, my favorite Far Side comic. It's the guy in the in the back of the orchestra, the cymbal player, and he's like saying, don't screw up, don't screw up, don't screw up, don't screw up. And he's only holding one cymbal. Loophole. All right. That's all Instagram. At least all the ones that I can get to load... I'm out of coffee, so I'm switching to the heavy stuff. And on to the YouTube questions. Gold Dude 0 asks, is James actually your dad? Will there be more Caterpillar footage? How long can you go without touching a budget gun? Uh, James is actually my little brother, but it's funnier if he pretends to be my dad. Uh, there will be more animal footage. I don't know if it's gonna be Caterpillars necessarily. Like whenever I travel somewhere for TFB with Luke, um, we always try to get some kind of local wildlife or local cats. Kind of depends on where we're at. So uh, we tried to get footage of like alligators in Florida, but we couldn't. So all we got was like a depressed cat under a U-Haul. Um, so yeah, I don't know. Can't can't promise that I'll ever see another caterpillar again because who can make that kind of promise to themselves? How long can you go without touching a budget gun? Since I usually carry a budget gun, I, uh, I guess like eight hours or something. Timeman604 asks, what is your dream firearm that otherwise you could never own? I think I could probably own almost all firearms. Some of them would just be like hard to find or prohibitively expensive. So if we're going with like something that I literally couldn't own, it would probably be like rare prototypes or yeah, something that never like reached a, a final stage. So I think it'd be something like like the Steyr uh, ACR or something, like one of those weird trials rifles or something that got super advanced and, and never had more than like a handful produced of which probably one still exists deactivated in a museum somewhere. So yeah, something like that. Um, anything from like, like a post project salvo or whatever it was when like flechette ammo and duplex ammo and caseless ammo and high tech composite materials or whatever. One of those would be really cool just to be able to to experience it because the number of people that have shot guns that were like that was probably limited to just the engineers and the, the guys doing the test at the time. So definitely an experience most people don't have. Eldritch asks, how do you feel about the US Army's adoption of the M5 and the 6 8x51 hybrid cartridge? Do you see it as a step forward, a step back, or more of a step sideways? Uh, I think it's definitely a step back. There's a really excellent video by Jeff Gerwich of Modern Tactical Shooting. Uh, talking about the M5 and the, you know, the the Fury slash like 6851, you know, super powerful cartridge. Um, and he is basically of the opinion that it's absolutely a step in the wrong direction. And I think that's because uh, there's a very good reason why we stopped using battle rifles. We being, you know, mil modern militaries of the world, <laughs> you know, like me. For a long time, the the word was fire and maneuver. And now it's not even that anymore. It's like fire and call for fire. So I think uh, Jeff Gerwich says that like his most important weapon is the radio. His you know Mark 18 Mod Zero is just a PDW to keep him out of trouble while he calls for fire because that's kind of how the modern battlefield works. Infantry weapons have never been casualty producing weapons. It's all about heavy machine guns, uh, indirect fire, you know, explosives, grenades, even produce the majority of, of casualties. So do you need to defeat level six Russian armor? Uh, 
not if they don't have it, and also no, in general you don't. You need to shoot bullets close enough to them that they stay there while the fire support arrives. So, uh, yeah, infantry weapons almost don't matter as long as they produce some amount of fire downrange. Calvin Fang, what made you stray away from your old channel to this one? What stirred your passion for creating videos, and who inspired your videos? Um, mostly, I just kind of got out of the habit of like playing new video games, and uh, once I was not like, you know, immersed in the community or the scene anymore, I just kind of got less and less interested in it. Um, but also, I always found those vid uh, videos were really difficult for me to produce. Um, as for like what stirred my passion for creating videos, it's mainly videos are an excuse to write stuff. Uh, because nobody reads anymore, so writing the, the written word on the internet is almost a waste of time. But people still watch videos, so if I write something and turn it into a video, then I'm tricking people into reading it with their ears. The gun video specifically is mainly inspired by Nut and Fancy, just because he was, uh, for the longest time, one of the only people who had uh, the appropriate mindset and the appropriately critical outlook. Uh, there's so many people in the gun reviews space who just have zero zero mindset and uh, zero critical thinking skills. So they basically just, they see guns as a, as a fun toy and they like shooting guns, which is understandable. Guns are cool, shooting guns is very cool. So they're just stoked to be there. Those people tend to make for really good shills, not because they're trying to shill or because they're bought out or anything like that, just because, you know, that's their, that's honest to them is just being like, hey, I like guns, I like new guns, this gun is new, hell yeah, let's let's go for it. Um, but that information is not very useful. So I like to research and analyze some, something and then try to distill that information down into a video. Um, and the way that I do that is by writing them. And then once they've been written, I have no choice but to produce them, even though I don't enjoy the video production part very much. Tyra Lee asks, who is Sox the Cat and what is your relationship with him? Uh, Sako is not really a stray cat. I would describe him more as a homeless cat. Uh, he doesn't have a fixed abode, so he stays with me. Um, Sako is one of the most like well put together neighborhood street cats I've ever met. Like he's just takes good care of himself, well groomed, very approachable, very professional looking because he's got his tuxedo and his and his two little uh, white mittens or socks on the back feet. So. He's just a very, very clean cut looking cat, and that leads to people trusting him more than they would like a mangy stray. He's, you know, he's no less of a freeloader, but he just looks, you know, he looks like if you just help him out a little bit, then he'll pull himself up by his bootstraps. You know, you're like, oh, just give him a couple dollars and he'll probably get a job tomorrow. You're not worried that he's gonna go blow it on, on smack. Southern Marksman asks, I remember you mentioned that you disliked the P226 because it was obsolete the moment it was introduced or something to that effect. Can you elaborate on that? Yes, so by the time the SIG 226 came out, uh, it was one of the heaviest, uh, the heaviest and largest pistols for its caliber, and it shoots worse than almost everything else that was on the market at the time or came out since. Nick Lewis 6052 asks, aside from looking cool, do you think quad Picatinny rails still have a place on modern ARs? No, absolutely not. Um, if you really want more rigidity in a rail, you can get a thicker, heavier rail that still uses M-Block and it's going to use the same amount of material or less material more efficiently. So, uh, you know, if you just want heat sink capacity or you want rigidity, you want it to have solid lockup or just flex, all that stuff can be accomplished with M-Lock, and it will be lighter and probably cheaper than equivalent Picatinny. Picatinny is a very inefficient use of material, and it's also incredibly time-consuming to machine, because it's so much fucking work. Um, so, yeah, no. Quad rails, and, you know, no one's ever actually populated the entirety of a quad rail. People don't even use the left and right sides of the quad rail. Matthew Cusinelli8772 asks, I've noticed in many of your videos you have a wide array of magazines material-wise. Do you use whatever you have or do you use certain mags based on what you're doing? Um, I don't have a lot of magazine preferences per se. Um, I will pretty much use anything 
as long as all of my magazines match uh, materials wise. So that's part of my OCD, I guess. But like, I would really like to have all P mags or all of the same color of metal mags um, or all of the same color of spray painted P mags and not mix and match. As far as the actual magazines go, like I love Gen 2 P mags because they're ubiquitous, cheap, uh, impeccably reliable and because they don't have the over-insertion lug on the back, so they go in and out of uh, chest rigs and, and plate carrier placards a lot easier. I also like military style, you know, USGI Stan Ag stuff, uh, especially with the Magpul L plates on the bottom, which gives them a little bit more length uh, and a little bit more uh, resistance to being like dropped on rocks and stuff. But I don't really have too much of a preference between those two. I just don't use weird off-brand magazines because at best you save like 50 cents on the mag but they're way worse uh, and I don't use Lancers because you know. Andre3470 asks best peanut butter complimentary item fluff Nutella jelly other I don't think you can put Nutella and peanut butter together that sounds weird because I think Nutella is just like flavored peanut butter so correct me if I'm wrong I don't like Nutella at all um and when I tell people that, they're like, oh, you didn't try like the European stuff that actually has the proper like amount of sugar in or whatever. No, tried that too. Not a, not a fan, it's kind of weird. Um, uh, a fluffernutter sandwich on toast, that's a pretty solid uh, snack item. I think I learned about that from watching The Sopranos. There's like an episode where some mobster goes to his mom's house or whatever, because he's like, he's got a, I don't know, hideout or he's just like got to check on his, check on his mom's and she's like you want I should make you a fluffer nutter and he's like yeah sure thing ma so uh those are pretty good but yeah peanut butter and jelly fantastic um the best peanut butter of course is jiff because you don't have to mix it for 25 minutes before you can make a fucking sandwich and uh yeah it's got s some sugar in it it's got like four ingredients instead of three ingredients who cares dude ballistic aviation aka luke c asks i'm proud of you man that's not a question retard Dr. Noblex6271 asks, what is a concept, be it a method of shooting or firearms technology or a product that you feel needs to come back? Uh, I'm gonna go with uh, a shooting method. I think people should start getting back into the habit of shooting with the rifle stock in the shoulder and a proper cheek weld and your support hand in a neutral position uh, because people are getting way too bent over the gun now uh, which works really well when you're a range turret, but not so much when you actually have to move. Daniel Alves 8203 asks, any firearms or shooting related books that you found super helpful or made you understand something in a new way? Um, I don't think I've ever read a firearms book. Um, when I first started to get into guns, I read a ton of like personal blogs just from people who were like me. They were just random dudes who wanted to write about the gun stuff they were experimenting with. Um, one of them that I really, really liked is called High Powers and Handguns, and I believe it's still up, but I don't think it's been updated in over a decade. Uh, and that's a phenomenal website. The guy was a, like a really quite accomplished handgun shooter and collector of interesting handguns and hand loading and stuff like that. So High Powers, obviously, but a lot of other stuff, Spanish pistols. Um, I'll try to put a link to that one in the video description because I, I really love that website. It's excellent. Uh, and the other one that I, I can think of off the top of my head was uh, The Box of Truth, which I read very religiously, uh, I think when I was like in college, which was, you know, a whole bunch of it was just like uh, ad hoc kind of Fackler style ballistic testing on water jugs and through, you know, experimental um, intermediate layers. But that guy and uh, one of his buddies, old retired dudes with time on their hands, they would buy back when you could get like a crate of just completely beat to shit Mosins or whatever for a hundred bucks. You get five rifles for a hundred bucks. He and his buddy would buy a couple crates, split the rifles up, and then they would all refinish them and turn them back into shooters. And uh, I, that's, I don't really consider refinishing a, a piece of shit surplus rifle to be sacrilege. Um, you know, not modifying it anyway, just taking a gun that's literally so dirty and disgusting that it doesn't work, cleaning it up, you know, sanding the wood, refinishing it. Uh, you know, painting, painting or rebluing, and turning it back into a piece that can actually be shot. I'm totally cool with that, and I love reading about those things. And that's actually um, one of my surplus rifles is a, a Yugoslavian Mauser, which is was in such bad shape that I don't think I would have really considered it like even shooter grade. And I refinished it sort of along those lines, you know, uh, cleaned, stripped, uh, restained the stock, and uh, applied, you know, like a clear coat style thing to it. 
turn it back into a respectable looking shootable rifle. Guru Man Lives 4231 asks, you usually do reviews on semi-automatic, primarily AR platform guns, but it would be interesting to see your take on hunting rifle and bolt action style guns. Uh, the main reason that I don't do that is because it's so hard to shoot to great distances um, in my part of the world. Um, and the, the, uh, the accuracy advantages or the shootability advantages of like a quality bolt action are not felt at the ranges that I typically shoot at. So there's just no appeal to them. You know, it's like investing in another uh, type of gun entirely for no benefit. So if I really ever had access to super long range shooting facilities, I would love to get into bolt actions and precision, but it's just, it's not possible really. Anonymous non-existent asks, will you ever do a video on the Smith & Wesson metal frame series like the third gens? I've seen mention of them, but there hasn't been a video dedicated to them yet. Uh, I sold both of my third gen Smiths. I had a 6904 and a 4506, both third gen guns. Uh, and they're, they're beautiful guns and they're really cool, but they don't really shoot that great. And they're so ubiquitous as to be a little bit boring. Uh, the most interesting thing about them, I guess, is just that the, the naming scheme was complete nonsense. Just like, just a whole bunch of numbers shot then out onto a page. You know, you gotta use a decoder ring to figure out what model you're looking at. Um, you know, I would, probably would buy another one. It would be one of the very basic, like, police-style, full-size duty 9 millimeters. you know, like a 639, or 659, rather, um, or a, uh, Jesus Christ, see, 5906. Um, you know, just to, just to keep one in, in the collection, because, yeah, I, I didn't like the 4506, and I didn't really like the 6904, so I got rid of them. There's also just, like, no history there. You would think that because there were so many of those guns for so long that there would be, like, interesting stories, but there's just not. Like, they're so boring. It's tragically boring. Concerned Mom 4204 asks, How do you approach the scripts you write for TFB as opposed to your own channel? Uh, I think when I write scripts for TFB, I try to include more of the bullet points because a lot of people just refuse to Google anything. So if I say that a gun has a 16-inch barrel threaded half by 28 with a mid-length gas system, that's kind of a waste of time and breath because that's information you could just get out of the spec sheet. Now, if I'm doing it for TFB, there's a, probably a good chance that you saw that video before you heard of the gun in the first place because a lot of that stuff is like new product. So. In that case, it's like, hey, you know, if I'm the one introducing you to the gun, I might as well give you some of the basic specs while you're here, save you the Google. But if I'm doing it for my own channel, it's usually a little more uh, analytical in nature. So I assume that you probably got here because you were interested in reviews of this specific item in the first place. So you probably know the basics and you want to know more like, is it reliable? Is it accurate? How are the ergonomics actually? You're not really just looking to get a bullet point rundown of like, you know, basically reading the cell sheet to you. And there are plenty of videos that do that and it's very irritating. They'll spend the entire runtime just reiterating the cell sheet and be like, and there you go, that's everything you need to know about the gun. It's like, no, that's nothing I needed to know about the gun. Uh, I need to know how it shoots, that's, that's important. Prickrolled asks, would you consider buying a bullpup? If so, what brand and model? I would totally consider buying a bullpup because I think they're very interesting and I think most of the shortcomings of the bullpup design like awkward reloads and bad triggers uh, don't matter super much. Like, I don't give a shit about triggers. Um, awkward reload. It's not like a roller delayed gun, for example, where you don't have last shot hold open and you can't insert a loaded mag on a closed bolt. Bullpups are just like a little clumsier. And that's not really a big deal. The main reason that I haven't bought a bullpup before is that a lot of them have other issues that are related just to the age of the design. Like, it takes a lot of money and aftermarket parts to be able to properly accessorize a Steyr AUG. But there are newer bullpups out there. Um, so yeah, if so, what brand and model? It would be a Desert Tech MDRX SE uh, because that one is, as one of the newest bullpup designs, I think it would take the least amount of work to set it up for use with, you know, night vision, white light, uh, sling, you know, modern, modern shooting equipment. Hillbilly057, what's the one piece of kit non-firearm related that you don't go to the range without and why? Uh, it'd just be stuff like gloves, shooting glasses, hearing protection, um, those uh, like tuna salad cracker snack packs. Uh, those are really good. It's got like crackers and tuna salad. And uh, yeah, it's like the best range snack that I've come across so far. Joshua Jones, 335. Do you ever miss your old Tahoe that you killed was? Those things are worth a mint now. I don't know about a mint. They're definitely worth a lot more than uh, I ever paid for or 
put into mine. Uh, but that's really just cars across the board right now because the market's all fucked. But yes, I miss that. I miss that Tahoe all the time. Uh, it was fucking huge. It was the the opposite of every other Tahoe that ever existed. Like you know, I talked to like mechanic friends about it, um, and they'd be like. Oh man, you better watch out for that transmission. You better, you know, your uh, your rear differential is gonna get fucked. Your uh, the Eaton locker never lasts on those things. But they would say, oh, don't worry, those you know those Chevy small block engines are absolutely bulletproof. So my Tahoe, uh, the transfer case was immaculate. The uh, the Eaton rear locker actually worked. The uh, the E80 um, electronic limited slip diff or whatever it is in the rear that worked perfectly fine apparently the only one that still works after 20 years um and my transmission was perfectly fine and the thing that ended up killing it was the engine it had a head gasket blow through and then cracked the uh cracked the heads so yeah um i would i would have loved to keep that thing but it was just not feasible to try to get it fixed or spend the money to have somebody else fix it um so yeah i do miss it i do miss how how big it was and just how how comfortable it was and I could fit so much gear in the back and I could still sleep in the back, like just put all my gear on one side of it and then throw down a sleeping mattress on the other side. Oh, love that truck. Didn't have air conditioning though. I think I bought it for just under $2,000 and I probably spent about $1,000 in like parts and stuff over the, I think a little over two years that I had it. So it was certainly worth every penny. Boston Misner 529 asks, what optics would you recommend for someone with a severe astigmatism? Severe, how severe? Um, the optics I would recommend are called contact lenses. They go directly on the surface of the eye and they squeeze it back into shape and they would help to correct your astigmatism. I'm sure you've already talked to, if you, if you know you have severe astigmatism, hopefully you've already talked to an optometrist and they've given you options for glasses and, and contact lenses, whatever. Um, yeah, if, if your astigmatism is severe, then you may have other vision issues as well. So like ACOG style prism optics are out because they don't have adjustable diopter. So probably not gonna work for you. Um, prism optics like the, uh, the primary arms GLX 2X or the micro prisms, not a bad idea for somebody with super bad astigmatism or LPVOs because you know you have, a, you have an etched reticle and an adjustable diopter. So yeah, if you cannot, make red dots work for you, then okay. S. Graham 8282 asks, what was your first rifle? It was a Marlin 795, which I still have. I bought it on Nut and Fancy's recommendation and I bought the 25 round mags on Nut and Fancy's recommendation. And that is the best 22 rifle I've ever shot. It weighs like three and a half, four pounds, something ridiculously light. Uh, and mine is just never jammed. Uh, can't say that about a Ruger 1022. Sam T5716 asks, what is your worst experience with FUDs? I don't shoot at ranges, so I don't have to experience FUDs very much. And if you do encounter a FUD out in the middle of nowhere, they're probably a very based FUD. So I wouldn't worry too much about that, unless they're a meth FUD, in which case they will kill you and steal the copper out of your car. I do get comments from annoying FUDs who are people that are just like, haven't bothered to keep up with like news or firearms law. People who think that like, uh, you know, not, not so much recently, but people who thought pistol braces were illegal for like the last four years, uh, or people who still think you can't shoulder a pistol, stuff like that. Uh, yeah, those people are really fun. Proper grammar spelled with a six asks, I'm not trying to start any drama, but where do you place yourself and your channel in the gun tuber plane with FUD to meme on the left, right axis and casual to boog on the up, down axis? Oh boy. Um, uh, I guess I would consider myself a boog fud. Strongly in boog fud territory. Matthew Williams 9643 asks, where'd you learn how to make such professional PowerPoint presentations? Uh, I went to a prestigious four-year university and I had to make very regular PowerPoint presentations. And those skills translate reasonably well to, uh, to Google Slides, which is like PowerPoint for people with no money. The Frog Strata asks, what is your favorite Mountain House flavor and have you tried the new Buffalo Mac? No, um, my favorite Mountain House flavor is still probably beef stroganoff uh, and then the biscuits and gravy is really good. Uh, I got a pouch of the new Buffalo Mac. I'm waiting to try it in a situation where I'm hungry and cold so that hopefully I will like it because the regular mac and cheese was disgusting. Hopefully the Buffalo Mac is good, 
but you gotta be pretty hungry to uh, to want to enjoy one of those. Jay Lender 333 asks, how did you get so knowledgeable and how did you get into the industry? Ah, oh, shucks, I don't know about knowledgeable per se. Um, I think I'm just extremely incredulous. So I read and take in a ton of information, but I just don't believe any of it. I guess, how did I get so knowledgeable and how do you get into the industry? It's kind of the same thing. You gotta basically wanna do this on your own regardless. So like, you know, I think a lot of people out there are sort of like, I'm gonna become a gun tuber and people will send me free shit. You're gonna have to buy a lot of your own shit first. Um, but that's how you get into, you know, like I buy a shit ton of guns and, and gear and all that stuff and I test it out. So that gives me a lot of industry knowledge and also if you start doing that people will start to notice it so at some point companies are like wow you've reviewed some of our products uh, and then they know you exist that could be a positive or negative thing depending on i guess how you feel about their products but uh yeah how did i actually get into the industry it's nepotism because my younger brother james reeves offered me a job mr diego smm asks have you ever tried airsoft do you find bb wars interesting for developing skills that cannot be developed at the shooting range have you ever tried bb wars under nods with tracer bbs if not you should um i have not played airsoft since i was a kid you know doing like backyard airsoft planking but uh, i do find it very interesting and a lot of those like large milsim events i think sound like a really awesome way to sort of practice um i don't know field craft maybe not the right term but you know whatever whatever you would call those skills, you know, the martial skills of just like moving and coexisting with a group of dudes trying to accomplish an objective. Um, I don't think anybody makes the claim that they're good for like real shooting practices because airsoft guns have incredibly short range. So, you know, uh, a lot of the stuff like you'll probably tend to feel very safe at long range in a way that you shouldn't. And it's something you wouldn't want to get used to per se. But yeah, there seems like there's a ton of value there. Main reason that I haven't gotten into it is because I think I'd have to do quite a lot of travel to do that, and I'd have to invest in a whole bunch of additional redundant gear. It was like, you know, uh, clones of my <laughs> clones of my existing gear in airsoft form. So it'd be a lot of money to spend. Uh, so yeah, not something I've tried. Matthew Balberchak ninety five ten asks: Assuming the type of gear autism you have doesn't give you sensory overload, do you have a favorite band or song? Um, I can never pick a favorite band. Well, I think I'll, I'll just pick one that, that springs to mind. Um, yeah, I don't know. Favorite favorite song? Uh, shout out to Luke C. It's the Chipmunks on 16-bit Keep Me Hanging On cover. Uh, but generally, like, favorite band, favorite genre of music. I really like black metal. And my favorite band that I can think of off the top of my head is uh, Flight of Sleep Air, which is a Colorado-based black metal band. More like... Uh, <laughs> what's the, I've described them as black acid folk prog metal before to people who have asked those guys are good poor skateboard asks do you ever enjoy shooting revolvers or lever guns etc for fun uh i don't shoot for fun anymore i don't find shooting very fun anymore so yes i enjoy shooting revolvers and lever guns um revolvers are extremely fun to shoot lever guns i don't know i've never been super into like the cowboy thing too much um i like bolt actions i like milserp like military bolt actions but lever guns just don't have that same kind of appeal to me i guess and it might just be because they're slightly too old or they don't have as much like military uh focus couldn't explain it tricky carp asks are there any other chamberings for the ar-15 besides 556 and 300 blackout that interest you yes i love the idea of 65 grendel or six millimeter arc for sprs um because or um even like 68 spc like there's a real case to be made for you know uh taking the ar and saying like okay we've shortened the barrel so much it's kind of getting ridiculous you know if the 556 cartridge was supposed to be shot out of a 20 inch barrel and almost everybody's got an 11.5 maybe it's time we we came up with a new cartridge so 300 blackout is like eight inches seven inches whatever 68 spc i think as far as I can and remember, uh, should do pretty well out of maybe something as short as like a 12.5 or something. Um, but yeah, like six millimeter arc or six five Grendel from an approximately 16 inch rifle, significantly better BC, significantly easier to make hits at range and they retain energy better than uh, even the heavy loads of 5.56. So I'm very interested in alternate chamberings for the AR, but it never really uh, approaches the level of getting me invested in them because so many of them come and go, first of all. Um, 
and the performance gains are so slight that it ultimately isn't that important. Like you'll save a lot of money by just buying 77 grain match ammo for your 5.56 gun versus building a whole other upper, getting a whole bunch of mags, load testing, whatever, for six arc. Um, and then yeah, just the fact that stuff gets discontinued. Like what if you were that guy who got super into 6.5 Grendel and now everybody's moving to six arc. So you can't get uh, good barrels anymore, you know, or you have a hard time finding the projectiles or something. So yeah, I don't want to get lost in the weeds with some boutique cartridge that then disappears. Um, like I feel bad for everybody who bought into 224 Valk, but I feel like even I, with not a lot of knowledge about hand loading, could tell that 224 Valk was bullshit. Then again, I thought 350 Legend was total bullshit, and that seems to be doing pretty good. So it's just not for me. Risky Krisky asks, what is your favorite kind of video or content to make and why? I am getting really excited about all these like discontinued optics. That has been the most interesting thing to me uh, because it's all kind of falls into that category of like recent history, but it's also not so recent that it's easy to find information about on the internet. So you gotta go into weird like sources and the Wayback Machine and try to find information about like discontinued stuff just from the late, uh, late 90s and early 2000s. So. I used to really enjoy, I still like uh, making like retro handgun videos, but those are a real pain in the ass to put together because a lot of that information is hard to get. Uh, it's, hard to, it's hard to find a visual aid to go on screen. I can tell you a lot of stuff about like Spanish gun manufacturing or, you know, the state of the market at the time, but if I don't have samples of guns to show and I don't have... Uh, there's no, like, you know, no news articles. I got to try to find like magazine clippings and stuff. A lot of that stuff is just difficult to make into a video. So as much as I love talking about, you know, 90s polymer or whatever, uh, old cop guns, that's cool to talk about, but those are hard videos to make. Goalie 171, what are your picks for most overrated guns in the current market? Anything piston driven, anything with a folding stock. Uh, they sound really great on paper and you think you want those features and then it turns out they don't help at all, and the compromises are not worth it. Black Tuesday 7427, what are your opinions on the news of a new marathon game coming out in the near future? They better fucking not. Farmer Boy 1129 asked, would slash will you retain spent mags during SHTF or similar? Yes, because they're not making any more of these. Gavin W9196 asks, as someone currently in the army, I feel as if I have handicapped my knowledge and skills growth in some areas like firearms, tactics, and training opportunities, but grown it in others, specifically medically and technically. Would you say that trade-off is worth it? Yeah, I'd say so. Um, there are a lot of skills in life that are really hard to just learn on your own, like through Google or just through fucking around in the woods, but Firearms and tactics are probably among those things. Um, yeah, you can you can learn that stuff later on your own time. All right, so my camera battery is dying. I'm out of caffeine, and I'm coughing so much that I can't get through an entire answer. So let's go ahead and cut it off there. That was fun. Let's do that again sometime uh, at the next milestone, which is like 250,000 subscribers maybe. Actually, I don't think I'm gonna get there. I think there's probably 200,000 people in the entire world who would subscribe to this channel, and I'm not sure I'll be able to find all of them before I die, so, I don't know. We'll see what happens. Thanks for watching, everybody. Thank you for subscribing. Thank you for commenting. Um, subscribe star in the video description. My cat says hi.